Okay, I'd like to introduce Glenn Prickett now, Chief External Officer from the Nature Conservancy, who will um, begin the program. So, Glenn. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we, we really appreciate your coming out. Um, thank you for making time out of what I know is a busy schedule for everybody, particularly those of you who are working up on the Hill. Um, I'm going to uh, start off, and, and then I'm really proud to be able to introduce my colleague, Neil Hawkins, who's going uh, to wrap up. Uh, and we're going to do everything we can to keep this concise, because we really, really want to encourage you in a conversation. Um, I, I, I've been really pleased to be associated with ICCF for many years, and just really want to thank John and his ABLE team uh, for putting this lunch together and for doing such great work to bring this, this kind of coalition together. Um, I've had the privilege of speaking at a number of these ICCF events over the years. Uh, they've all been good, they've all been important, but it's safe to say I'm most excited uh, about this collaboration we're going to talk about today, uh, probably more than, than other things I've had a privilege to talk about in front of this group. Um, and that's not just because uh, Dow is a great uh, company, which they are, or that because this isn't a great project, which it is, uh, but it really uh, represents an important shift that's going on in not just the Nature Conservancy, but the conservation community in general. Um, and I think the project really gives life and form to an idea that has been central to the International Conservation Caucus and, and the ICCF since its creation. Um, that conservation isn't just a nice thing in and of itself. Conservation is really central to our uh, national well-being, our national security, um, our economic interests, uh, and, and, our, and our way of life. Um, and um, we'll explain uh, how that is. Um, I'm going to start off with just some overview comments about the concept, and then Neil is really going to um, uh, tell the story of the collaboration. Um, I think I have a clicker. I have not rehearsed this, so hopefully I can make it work. No? Okay. Um, I think we're doing the next slide, please. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, nope, sorry, back. False alarm on the next slide, please. There you go. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that this is uh, really represents a new idea uh, or a sh an important shift going on in the conservation movement. Um, so the Nature Conservancy turned 60 last year. Uh, we celebrated our 60th anniversary. Uh, we're proud of everything we've accomplished over those 60 years. Uh, we protected an area of land and water larger than the state of California, if you put it all together. So um, it all started with this group of people um, in uh, Westchester County in New York um, who came together concerned about the loss of a very important um, natural area uh, in their community, the Mianus Gorge. Um, I had a chance to go there a few months ago, uh, and it's a, a really uh, beautiful uh, small uh, river gorge. Um, and this group of people came together concerned about development and the impact it would have. Uh, and they had a radical idea, which was let's just put our money together uh, and, and raise money and, and buy it uh, and take it out of development. Uh, so that was uh, what the Nature Conservancy's first project was. Uh, it's still there today in its uh, pristine form. Uh, and we took that model and we started doing it in larger and larger scales all around the world, and that got us where we are today. Um, but as we look ahead, we've realized that that model and that approach that got us to where we are today isn't really going to achieve the mission uh, of global conservation going forward. Uh, and I think um, all of our conservation groups are, are having that same conversation. And uh, when the conservation partners of ICCF get together, Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, we're all going through this, uh, this shift to say, uh, what is the approach to conservation that's going to work in the future? If you'd go to the next slide, please. And what we've realized is that what we've learned how to do over these decades, uh, conserving important lands and waters, actually becomes an important part of the solution to some bigger challenges that our country uh, and our world are facing. Uh, and so we're moving from protecting nature from people, uh, which had an important place uh, in the 20th century as development threatened to overrun uh, these important natural areas, moving to protecting nature for people uh, in terms of the value that nature provides for our societies. Uh, the clean water that we depend on comes from nature. The clean air that we breathe comes from nature. Uh, the protection against increasingly uh, dangerous and, and uh, intense storms, coastal floods, uh, 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 comes from nature. Um, our scientists call this ecosystem services. Um, it's a, a fancy word for what we would call the value of nature. Uh, and that's really where the conservation movement in general is going. 
Um, this gentleman, um, uh, Larry, uh, you see on his, on his coat, really uh, in that sense represents the future where the conservation movement is going. Uh, this is a group of people we brought together uh, last year in Mobile Bay in Alabama, uh, a community volunteer effort to restore oyster reefs. Uh, a few of us were talking before the lunch about the important oyster restoration that's going on here in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but what we're doing, uh, in fact, with federal and state agencies and, and, and business partners uh, is restoring nature, in this case, uh, the oyster reefs that once lined uh, the Gulf of Mexico and so much of the East Coast, um, not just because it uh, provides good habitat for uh, marine life, which it does, uh, but because it restores the fishery, uh, it cleans the water, and importantly, it protects those important coastlines against increasing storm damage. Um, so this is uh, where the conservation movement is going. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, it's, it's a, it's, as we were discussing just at lunch, it's a simple idea that nature has value, but when you get into it, uh, it, it quite complicated in terms of really trying to analyze and assess what that value is. Um, this slide is probably very hard to read from where you are, uh, but this comes from a worldwide uh, study called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, where about 1,500 scientists from around the world got together and asked this question, what's the value of nature? Uh, and what's happening in the natural world and what's that going to mean for value into the future. And they identified a whole series of ecosystem services uh, from all the way from the mountains down to the oceans in terms of fresh water, food supply, recreation, storm protection. Um, and there have been a variety of efforts to put a value on this. Uh, the first study said that it's $33 trillion every year is the effective value of nature to the global economy, uh, which turns out to be larger than the man-made uh, global economy. Uh, now, a lot of uh, uh, economists have poked holes in that number, uh, but the, the importance of the, um, uh, of the resource is clear. Uh, the most recent assessment called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity that was sponsored by the UN Environment Program, uh, led by a, a gentleman named Pavan Sukdev, former uh, Deutsche Bank executive, uh, came out with a figure of about uh, 6 to 7 percent of global GDP coming from the value of nature. Uh, and interestingly, for those of you in the room who are working on foreign policy and foreign assistance, that number rises very steeply when you look at what he called the GDP of the poor. Uh, he found that if you look at uh, communities in poverty, about 60 percent or more of their GDP comes out of the value that nature provides. Um, so for the foreign policy, foreign assistance policymakers in the room, nature becomes a really important asset for sustainable development uh, and, and national security. Uh, uh, not just for biodiversity and nature in its own right. And, and that really is the direction that, uh, that we are moving as a conservation community, and I think ICCF work, uh, ICCF's work really represents this well. If you go to the next slide. So I just wanted to give a couple of very practical examples of this that we're working on um, before I introduce Neil, just so you can, you can get a feel for what this means. Um, so I talked about the, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, just to elaborate that on a minute, uh, elaborate on that for a minute. Um, the oil spill two years ago in the Gulf Coast drew the nation's attention to the Gulf in a very important way. Um, what a lot of people still don't realize is that the environmental uh, deterioration of the Gulf uh, was in motion long before the spill. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, is, is even more significant and important than the impact that the spill itself will have. Um, and it has to do with the decisions we've made as a society to develop the Gulf over the last uh, century, from, uh, from levying and, and channeling the rivers uh, so that they no longer flood in flood season and return silt into the marshes, um, to coastal development that has cut canals and channels through the marshes, uh, and now to sea level rise and more intense uh, storms that are happening in the Gulf. If you combine all that, the Gulf Coast is subsiding. In Louisiana, we're losing an area of coastal marsh the size of a football field every half hour. Um, so significant that the maps of the area have to be re redrawn every decade because we're, the land is, is literally uh, eroding into the ocean. Uh, so it's a crisis for the Gulf, but it's a, it's a silent crisis that's playing out in slow motion. Most of the country isn't aware of it. Um, the Nature Conservancy and other conservation organizations have made the Gulf of Mexico a priority to restore those coastal marshes and restore those oyster reefs that provide important natural infrastructure. They provide a natural buffer against the storm surges that are eating away at the marshlands. Uh, we're working with NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers on oyster bed restoration throughout the Gulf. That shot of the uh, Mobile Bay uh, Volunteer Day is an example of that. We're also working with the Army Corps on how do we strategically breach some of the levees in areas where that won't present harm to communities but will allow the rivers to play their natural flooding function and return sediment to the marshes and build up the marshes again. 
Um, this will have significant economic value to communities in terms of storm protection, making them less vulnerable to coastal storm surges, uh, fisheries recovery, bringing the oyster fishery back, uh, and other fisheries that depend on the oyster reefs for habitat, uh, and water quality, uh, beginning to filter out some of the contaminants that are coming down the rivers uh, into the Gulf. Now, what's the value of that? We don't know. We're, we're working uh, with a partnership called the Natural Capital Project to get in the water on the coast and do some economic assessments of what the value of oyster restoration will be. But we know there will be a positive um, rate of return on conservation investments that the federal government, the state government, and private actors are making in restoring the marshes and the oyster reefs. Uh, and too often here in Washington in our budget discussions, we talk about outlays for conservation. We, don't, we should be thinking of them as investments that have a return in terms of the economic value to the communities. That's what we're trying to do here. If you go to the next slide. Similarly, as you move up the Mississippi from the Gulf, uh, the floodplains all along the Mississippi River play an incredibly important role in protecting communities and farms against flooding. Uh, we saw that uh, in the tremendous floods last year along the Mississippi and the Missouri. Um, in certain areas where the Nature Conservancy and others have been able to do floodplain restoration, uh, the impact on the downstream communities was much less than it would have been otherwise uh, had we not been able to restore important areas that had been taken out of floodplain and put into uh, intensive farming. We were able to purchase some of those areas, put them back into floodplain. Uh, again, we're working on the valuation of that. Uh, there's an important economic development opportunity here for the United States. The, the Mississippi Delta remains the poorest region of this country. Uh, you have poor farmers there who could earn a new revenue stream from becoming uh, providers of an ecosystem service, flood protection for downstream communities, uh, as well as uh, farmers of cotton and other commodity crops. Uh, so we're working with the USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service, to figure out how do we devote farm bill resources in a very targeted <coughs> way to helping local farmers restore floodplains, uh, and then working with downstream communities to set up markets for ecosystem services that can compensate uh, those farmers for the service they're providing. Um, and last example I wanted to give, if, if you've been to ICCF lunches and you've been paying attention, you'll know this story, so I'll be brief, but uh, we're very proud of it. Um, originally in the city of New York, there was a model that was created some years ago where uh, New York was looking at building a new water treatment plant, and they realized it would be less expensive to pay farmers in the Catskills to, uh, to protect uh, the watershed, to keep uh, uh, sediment and pollution out of the water, than it would be to build a new water treatment plant. Uh, we took that idea to Latin America, and here in Quito, we uh, worked with the city uh, and the surrounding communities on the first ever water fund for Latin America. Uh, we were able to put together, I think it was an $8 million fund with, with key support from USAID uh, in the very beginning, uh, and then bring in water users, bottling plants, um, electric companies who rely on hydroelectricity, um, to put a fund together to compensate poor farmers in the upland watersheds to protect and restore their forests. Uh, the model worked. Uh, we then replicated it in Bogota, Colombia, uh, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, we're now partnering with the Inter-American Development Bank and the Global Environment Facility to take this water fund model to 45 cities around Latin America. Uh, we'll be providing clean water for tens of millions of people, benefiting poor farmers in the watersheds. Uh, nature conservation, biodiversity protection is sort of the bonus in this uh, transaction. Uh, the real economic value is fresh water and, uh, and economic development for rural communities. Um, this is a great place to hand off the microphone to Neil Hawkins. Um, we've been really proud to work with Dow. Um, the collaboration you'll hear about from Neil really was his vision. Uh, it started with some good conservation projects that we did together in Michigan. Uh, and uh, last uh, example of that, Dow supported our water fund in Sao Paulo. Uh, really more uh, to do good for the, for the country of Brazil and the city of Sao Paulo. Um, but it, I think, planted a seed in Neil's head that then uh, took shape in the collaboration that he's going to tell you about. So thanks for your attention. Neil Hawkins, who's the uh, Vice President for Health, Safety, and Environment at Dow Chemical Company, and a good friend. Okay. All right. I think I've got it working. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. This is an extremely exciting collaboration. I'm going to try in maybe five to eight minutes give you some flavor for why we believe it's so exciting. And no, it, it wasn't my idea, it was a collaborative idea, and he's very generous to um, uh, cite that I had some role in it. Um, let me, uh, you know, this, this notion of economics, environment, and social coming together and sustainable development is something that's been around a long time. But the reality is, it, it is a great model if you can make the economics 
actually work with the social and with the environment. And that's been a gap, actually, in advancing sustainable, uh, sustainable development. It's the economics piece working with the science on the environment. And that's really what we're focusing on in this collaboration. Um, you might ask, why did, how did Dow even remotely come up with an idea of getting into this? We have a very strong tradition in sustainability goals. We've been at this for 15 years, and actually we're now more than 115 years old. So we've been around a long time. But for, for the last 15 years, we've been very seriously implementing sustainability goals to change ourselves, so less in our own footprint, but in this set of goals, also help our customers through our science and technology reduce their footprint. So we have these goals that really focus here. We're halfway through those goals. They'll come due in, uh, in 2015. And a couple of years ago, Andrew Leveris, who's our CEO, said to me, Neil, at the midway point through our goals, where is there a gap? What are we missing that we really should pay attention to before we you know, wait five more years to announce a new set of goals? And I, I said to Andrew, now that moved on its own. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what that means. I said to Andrew, the area that I believe is missing in these goals is operationalizing what we call protecting the planet. Protecting the planet is a core value of Dow. We only have three, people, integrity, and protecting the planet. And I said, you know, we have environmental goals, we have goals to reduce our emissions, waste, et cetera, but how do you operationalize that? And that's where the idea of getting into the business decision making of the company so that you could build in the environment and ecology right into business decisions, that's where it came from. But that wasn't an easy task. And, and so we had to find a partner, and TNC is the partner that has the science and the economics expertise to actually help bring this together. But this is new stuff. I don't want anybody walking out of here thinking that there's an off-the-shelf ready answer for how another company or even my company can incorporate this. We are cutting new ground in this collaboration. And everything we do will be transparently reported. We're not trying to corner an intellectual property here as Dow. We're trying to advance a cause uh, that we believe will lead to a better planet because business will incorporate these things into their decisions. Now, this is a picture of our Guarajá site uh, down in Brazil. And I, I put this in there uh, just to give you a sense. Dow is global, and almost everywhere we have a plant is on water, and it's usually near salt water. This is on salt water. That green area to the right is a mangrove that we actually restored. This was pre-collaboration. And Dow's been doing a lot of work all through its history in conservation. So we've given a lot of donations, we've bought a lot of land, TNC's conserved a lot of land with us. So we're probably you know, in the upper tier of companies in doing that. But we did it for philanthropy. We did it was because it was the right thing and it was a donation. Okay, this collaboration is not about philanthropy. This collaboration is about how do you actually create an economic case that a chief financial officer would say, we need to do this project in this way rather than that way because it, it increases the value to Dow, it increases the value to the community, and it's a platform of economics rather than just a donation. So that's really what we're doing here. And I've had a lot of people ask me, why didn't you just do this as a conservation project? It'd be much easier for TNC they can go out with the $10 million, and it's a five-year, $10 million program, and, and just conserve some land. But the leverage from the expertise they're, they're gaining through this and the expertise we're gaining will be enormous. Oh, it is moving on its own. I'm sorry. Um, I, I also want to introduce, and maybe uh, Glenn mentioned this, the idea of green infrastructure. 
okay? This is uh, our Cedra plant in Texas. And what you're seeing there, and I know it's hard to see, um, we had a situation about 10 years ago, so this is pre-collaboration, where we needed to build a, a new water treatment unit. And we had a courageous plant manager who said, you know what, I think we can do this by rebuilding a wetland and using that as green infrastructure instead of pouring the concrete to make gray infrastructure. And I say it's courageous because engineers don't work that way. They work by doing what's always worked and what they know they can get permitted. It takes a lot of extra work to prove that the wetland can do what the water treatment unit would do. But the reason why I bring this up, it's very important because it's a good illustration. This project saved Dow $40 million. Okay, it costs $2 million instead of $42 million. Okay, so that's big money on the bottom line. And it provides habitat because we restored a wetland to what it should have been or had been. So it provides habitat and it's much more natural and better for the environment. These are the kinds of solutions you want to find in this kind of project. Okay, our first collaboration is at Freeport, Texas. This is our largest plant in the world. It's arguably the largest chemical plant in the world. Uh, we, the sales out of this plant are $12 billion per year. So this is a major facility with lots of ships going in and out, lots of rail cars, but also a lot of shoreline, a lot of wetlands, and you need a lot of water to run a plant like this. So we're only doing one of our three pilots in the U.S. And so we agreed, let's do this at our, our major site. You know, we could have chosen a smaller site. It could have been easier to do. But we said, let's go for the Super Bowl or World Cup on the first one. And it, it, that's what we're doing. That's quite challenging. So what are we studying? We're studying water. Okay, and this is the beautiful Brazos River, uh, full. Okay, but as you probably read um, in the uh, papers, or lived it if you're from Texas, this was a, the worst drought really in Texas history, or one of the worst droughts in Texas history. And we use 100,000 gallons per minute of water. 100,000 gallons per minute of water. Okay, and this is what the river looked like last summer. Okay, is nature providing the Dow Chemical Company value? Absolutely. You may not understand it until the resource is removed, okay, but there's a lot more value being created by that water for us than just the cost of what it costs to move it in and out. So one of the projects that the Nature Conservancy is doing is studying the Brazos River watershed all the way up through Central Texas and figuring out with us ways that we can improve the flow of the river in good times or in drought conditions so that everybody along the river has access to this great resource. And so he mentioned water funds and other things. We don't know what the answer is going to be but we're studying what, you know, how can you value that water for a company that happens to sit at the end of that river, as well as for all the, you know, millions of people that also get benefit from that water. So there's a holistic study going on, and we'll figure out the rightful role of Dow within that to help, help that river flow, uh, whether or not it's a drought. Um, another area we're studying, this is just a, a pretty picture of the plant, is air quality. And looking at the interaction of trees and other vegetations on air quality. Our plant is 60 miles from Houston, but we're in the non-attainment zone of Houston for ozone. And so we're studying as part of this project whether or not the restoration, so again it's a conservation notion, whether the restoration of some of the, the trees and shrubs and wetlands provide value in removing precursors of ozone. So this is a, a study we're doing. Um, and then last, I mean that's, a, that's a, I believe Hurricane Katrina, this plant's right in Hurricane Alley. So we routinely have hurricanes going in and out and we're very well prepared 
to deal with them because it's a routine thing. But when you have a big one come through, then you're really testing your levees and trying to protect that plant. And one of the, one of the projects that we're studying is the value of wetlands in providing additional safety for your assets when you have these massive storm surges. And so we're studying that. It's actually a very complex subject. You might think it's easy to evaluate. It's not that easy, but our, you know, we're looking at the value of these wetlands to Dow, but also the communities and, and that whole interface and how that should be valued in a lot of different ways. So that's what we're doing in Freeport, Texas. Okay, we're working on this huge river model and understanding the economics of that river for us. We're looking at air quality and we're looking at wetlands and restoration. Our second pilot's going to be in Brazil. So we're going to move out of the U.S. to Brazil and th there are many challenges in a place like Brazil and we'll likely be working on that uh, in a region of conservation interest to the TNC but also uh, where we're doing some new construction and new work where we can uh, learn about ways to build that plant with less with higher conservation value. So uh, that'll end my remarks and I think we have a few minutes for questions if there are any. We do have a uh, a conservation report for Dow. Okay, so uh, online uh, at Dow.com you can get the Dow conservation report. There's also a Dow TNC collaboration report, which is our first year collaboration report that's available. Glenn, uh, Glenn and I would be happy to distribute that to anybody who would be interested, or it's available online. Thank you. Come on up. Well, listen, thank you, Neil and Glenn. I, I will tell you that's about as short and succinct a perfect message of what ICCF is trying to um, uh, promote up here on the Hill and, and around Washington as you can possibly get. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, we've had a lot of good programs up here, and uh, um, that is about the, uh, um, the antithesis of, of, of really what we're what we're trying to do. It's, it's private sector solutions with, um, with the government um, coming behind and uh, um, helping um, uh, either, either getting out of the way or uh, helping where they can to help leverage those public-private partnerships. Um, so thank you very much. We will take questions um, if anybody has on from either Glenn uh, or Neil. That was pretty good. Here's So, when you're putting a value on the on the water that you get out of the Brazos River, there is that, you know, what you would have to do to recreate that fresh water out of seawater. Is that how are you how are you getting to a value of that well, million gallons you were using a day? Or well, you know, I. This is what we're relying on TNC to help help us with, because there are many different ways you can look at at the value of that water, um, and one way to do it is looking at the cost. So you have the the cost of how to take the current water, move it, clean it, etc., all the way up through desalinating water. So that's on the cost side. Then there's a value side which is also a different way to look at water. And TNC is, is working with a variety of models, looking at different ways to do it. But this is very new ground. You know, it, it interacts very directly with really the community's value for the water, not just the company. So you, you really have to get very sophisticated in it. I don't know the answer. We're, we're all uh, collaborating to figure out where this will come out, but it clearly it's helping us think of ways to approach a river differently than just being just the intake pipe, and and so that's a very positive uh, aspect. Glenn, yeah, um, great great question, and it turns out to be incredibly difficult to answer. We just did a little seminar in the plant last week for for Neil and me and some of the plant executives to beat the science team. I should point out Jen Molnar 
Michelle Lipinski, Sarah Mascala, who are here from the Nature Conservancy, are kind of the, the key uh, core team making this go forward. Uh, and one of our um, PhD resource economists who's working on the water piece uh, walked us through that question, which is very hard to answer because as she described it, um, ideally you would do some microeconomics to understand the value of the water to the operations, but the way we you're able to measure water availability doesn't give you that nice curve. As she put it, you can't do calculus. Um, so really the best we're able to do is sort of a replacement cost of, okay, if you don't have the water, uh, what would it cost to build the next storage reservoir or the desal plant? Um, so it's not an ideal way to calculate it, but you sort of have to look at, at replacement cost. Um, that's probably more uh, math and, uh, and economics than we were all bargaining on, but it's, it just shows that all these things kind of seem simple when you do it in a 10-minute slideshow are actually pretty complicated when you try to put it in a form that a CFO could actually make an investment decision around, and that's what we're really trying to do in the collaboration. Do you expect to find um public policy impediments to implementing what your findings are, if you do, uh, what, what, it, what might you be doing about that, you know, because since we're here uh, on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I'll take a shot at that and then as Neil will jump in. So one of the exciting aspects of being down at the plant a few weeks ago uh, was getting our Texas state director together with the head of the, of the site. And what they started to come upon were not so much impediments to what we want to do as ways we could help kind of unlock some, some things that are stuck at the state level in Texas. So if TNC and the Nature Conservancy together go to the, the agencies and the legislature in Texas, we'd be able, we may be able to kind of move some things that they already want to do around water conservation, for example, or, or improved water management practices, but they haven't been able to get to work. But a, a, an important business, an important conservation group coming together might be able to get some things moving that haven't been moving. So it's, it's, it's less about undoing something that's bad than kind of together getting something moving that everybody wants to do, but they haven't been able to figure out how to do. I, I would just add that I, I think there's a, a, a lack of understanding amongst many companies about the value of nature to their activities. So often you hear, you know, this area discussed more as conservation versus growth and development. So you often see that. And I, I think out of our project it will be very clear, at least for a large manufacturing company, that the kind of value being generated and created in concert between nature and the company. And so I think over time, you know, from a public policy point of view, you'll start seeing uh, you know, different players coming to the table advocating for things that you might not expect because the, the understanding level's going up. And that's one thing that excites me about this project. I think we're going to help lift those boats all together. The question is, what, what's been the involvement of the local community when you all go in both here and, and abroad? Okay. You might want to repeat the question. Yeah, so a uh, great question from Jeremy from, um, from Congressman Carnahan's office. What's, what's been the involvement of the communities? Uh, so our, this collaboration is still at the very early stage, so we're just kind of getting our work going on the ground and starting to, to reach out to the community, so not a lot to report on that front. Um, I can say for the Nature Conservancy, this uh, becomes, a, you know, this is probably the most important issue we're, we're dealing with as we work on bigger scales in, in new places. How do you engage the community from the beginning? Um, to understand what they get out of nature, what's valuable about nature for them. So a, a lot of conservation in the past has been, okay, we've identified a rare species or an important habitat type. Now our scientists are saying, well, how do we talk to communities about what they need from nature in terms of clean water, clean air, coastal protection? So we're actually kind of revamping our approach as a conservation organization. We're not going to stop caring about the endangered species and the rare habitats. That's going to be very much part of the agenda, but we're going to be adding to that, okay, what does the local community need from nature, and how can our conservation investments provide that value? And, and hopefully as we get into this collaboration, we'll be doing that together in some of these sites. Yeah, I, I think as we branch out uh, in the current project, the community will become much, you know, more and more engaged. And then as we move into Brazil, we're already engaging with the local community um, already well ahead of when we uh, make final decisions and announce what we're going to do. So we recognize it's critical. Um, and all of these, uh, let's take something like wetlands. 
the protection we get as Dow of our site is also protection for the community. So understand, because the community's on the other side of our plant from, you know, behind these wetlands. So we're really also working with TNC to help articulate not just the value to Dow, but the value to the community at the same time. Okay, I've got to keep all these promises to people in this room uh, so that uh, we end on, on time, because I know everybody's busy, but uh, I think Neil and, and Glenn will stay here for a few minutes afterwards just to answer any more uh, questions you all might have. Thank you all so much for coming. I know it's a real busy week, um, and look forward to seeing you, I think, next week uh, where you've got a uh, briefing with Unilever. Um, so we look forward to that. So Tom, I think, will be up here to, to uh, discuss what they're doing. Thanks so much. <laughs>